Mr. McKay. Yes. You may. Your Honor, uh, the state has rested in the case, and uh, I just wanted to remind this court that at the beginning of this trial, yeah, I told you that David March is an innocent man, it's not just because he presumed innocent, because he was actually innocent. And after uh, sitting here during this trial and watching these witnesses testify and listening to what I had to say, it is Extremely clear that they mm -hmm. march was an action citizen's race in place. And uh, this innocent man sit before you today charged with three specific crimes conspiracy, obstruction of justice, and official misconduct. The evidence is lacking so much in this case regarding all three of these charges. I submit to your honor that as a matter of law, you must direct this case out. Find David March not guilty at this juncture. And, and I'm not clear, Your Honor, whether your standard of review at this juncture in a bench trial after the state has rested is that you're going to view the state's evidence in a light most favorable to them, or are you judging their evidence that they presented uh, beyond a, a reasonable doubt? Regardless of what your standard of review is here, I submit you must direct this case out regarding David March. That's how uh, lacking uh, the state's evidence is in this particular case. Keep this in mind. The conspiracy charge states that David March, Joseph Walsh, and Thomas Gaffney, with the intent that official misconduct be committed and with the intent that obstruction of justice be committed, they agreed with each other, Officer Van Dyke and other known and unknown co-conspirators. A couple of things. There is no evidence at this point that David March and Joseph Walsh and Thomas Gaffney even met each other before that night, none whatsoever. There is no evidence that David March, Joseph Walsh, and Thomas Gaffney communicated with each other after that night. And keep this in mind, this conspiracy charge states that the goal of this conspiracy was to conceal the true facts in order to shield Jason Van Dyke from investigation and prosecution, not or, and. And that it was their intent to keep these facts from independent criminal investigators and that the public would not see the video. Judge, David March inventoried the video in this case. He saved this video for these people to use against them. How in God's name is David March conspiring to conceal the true facts when he's saving the video for the world to see now. That's not the act of a co-conspirator with the intent to shield Jason Van Dyke from an investigation and prosecution. And by the way, he just didn't inventory the video of 813 Robert, which everybody clings to as the absolute truth. He also inventory 845 Roberts video. He and another detective inventory videos from Dunkin' Donuts. He's preserving evidence in this case. It's important to Mr. Maris to collect and save and preserve information. It was important to David March that night and every day following to preserve the evidence in this particular case. He was at the scene that night. And according to the police reports, which the state introduced into evidence, you know, Your Honor, that David March was overseeing the collection of evidence done by the evidence technicians that night. All 16 shell casings were picked up by evidence technicians under the supervision of David March. 
If he was conspiring to conceal the true facts, how about him picking up about seven or eight shell casings and putting them in his pocket? How about taking that video from 813 Robert and throwing it in the middle of Lake Michigan? It is shameful that David Marginus man is sitting here charged with these crimes when he gave all the evidence to these prosecutors. And by the way, the goal of this conspiracy, according to the special prosecutors, is to shield Jason Van Dyke from investigation and prosecution. That's a laugh. You know from the evidence judge, from the witness that testified, you know that the Cook County State Attorney's Office and the FBI were conducting interviews in January of 2015. You know that not only was the Cook County State Attorney's Office involved in an investigation, so was the U.S. Attorney's Office. You know from witnesses who testified and were impeached by federal grand jury testimony, the federal government was involved in this investigation in 2015. You know that in addition to the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Cook County State Attorney's Office, the Office of the Inspector General was taking sworn statements from people in this case. To charge David March and others that they are hiding facts from independent criminal investigators, that's a laugh. That's a joke. A bad one. But that's a joke. Heck, IPRA, the independent police review authority, was out at the scene that night. If you look at the police reports submitted by David Marsh, he listed four IPRA workers at the scene that night. Four of them. How is that hiding facts from independent police investigators. And, and, and to, to, to further show how ridiculous this indictment is, this indictment alleges that David March, Joe Walsh, Tom Gaffney, and others conspired so the public would not see the video. David March has no authority or ability to hide video evidence from the public or give it to the public. Those decisions are made by people downtown, like in City Hall, people that might be running for an election. David Marsh saved this video. How in God's name does any of this evidence prove that he's shielding this evidence from the public? And before we talk about a conspiracy, we have to prove that there is an agreement. Where is there evidence that David March agreed with Joseph Walsh and Thomas Gaffney or anybody else in this case to perform some illegal act? Where is your agreement? What you know is, Judge, based on the testimony that you've heard, David March is conducting independent interviews at the scene that night. He's taking one officer at a time, asking these officers what they saw. Now, did these officers see the video at the time of his interviews? No. But David March is a reporter at that moment. He is a reporter. His job is to write down what these witnesses tell him. He is not a judge. He's not an editor. He's supposed to write down what they say. Whether David March believes that or not, he is duty-bound to write a summary down of what these witnesses tell him. He cannot, in fact, he would be violating general orders and other rules and regulations that these prosecutors suggest. He would be violating it if David March didn't write down these words that these witnesses said to him. If a witness tells him a lie and he believes it to be a lie, Dave still has to write down those words. He doesn't have an option of reporting something Dave March feels is correct. Yet, that he, he, he's on trial because he took down notes. He took notes. Yet they want you to rely on, on testimony like people from like Earl Briggs who didn't take any notes. There is no evidence of an agreement. It, it, it doesn't have to be direct. You know, it could be implied, but there is no evidence that agreement was implied. The prosecution kept saying throughout this case, Parallel false reports. These are false reports. They keep spitting out the word false reports as if it's true. It's not. 
The more they say it, the more they want you to believe it because they don't have any evidence to prove it. Look, we can all look at a video and interpret different things. Dave is merely an investigator writing out what witnesses tell him. Regarding this conspiracy, the state put in emails. Now, <clears throat> Mr. Mayor's told us in no uncertain terms that the Chicago Police Department email system maintains, keeps, preserves all of the emails. Well, it begs the question, if David March was involved in a conspiracy, show us one email from him. Show us one email where he's copied by these other people, some of whom don't even live in this state. There is none. And if, if there was one, you would have seen it. You would have heard it. They would have asked Mr. Maris to identify it. They didn't. The only email is an email that stated March 15th at 10.33 p.m. And it's from his supervisor. And it's a conclusion. It's a, it's, a, it's a couple of sentences. Judge, how about showing us a reply email from Dave March? The police reports are submitted on that date. Show us some type of collusion. Show it. The other, these other emails are absolutely ridiculous. You have emails from Anthony Wojcik, Daniel Gallagher, Ron Hostel from the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund, Tom McDonough from Chicago FOP. If those emails were truly, truly in furtherance of the conspiracy, those men should be sitting here too. Aren't they reports? Aren't they writings that show this grand conspiracy? Judge, the police reports written by David Marsh were included in the state's evidence. We have a number of supplementary reports. One's 23 pages, another one's another 23 pages, another one's like seven or eight pages. There are evidence submission forms prepared by David Marsh from the Illinois State Police Crime Lab, listing all of the evidence that's collected in this case. And Dave is saying to those reports, to the crime lab, another independent police agency, work this evidence up. Don't hide a thing. In addition, all of the inventory slipped in this particular case with David March's name on is preserving evidence. All of the GPRs in this case, all of the general progress reports in this case were written by David March. All of them. One of the state witnesses, Joseph McGilligan, said, when he looked at the GPR of his interview, he said, yep, that's an accurate summary of what I told Detective March. Yes, sir. The only, the only person who came into this court in the state's case and said, I'm not, I didn't say one thing in Dave March's GPR was Laura Fontaine. Get to her in a second. But all of the other GPRs in this particular case that are made part of the file here, no officer came into court and said, I didn't say that. So let's take a look at Dora Fontaine. Dora Fontaine has testified so many times, I, I, I lost count. But it wasn't until she's threatened with being fired does she mysteriously become a witness. She doesn't even know why she's a witness. That's a lot of baloney. But you know, Your Honor, that prior, <coughs> under oath, inconsistent statements can be used as substantive evidence, meaning you, as a trier of fact, can consider her prior under oath statements as something that is like as if she's saying it in the courtroom today. The believability of a witness may be challenged 
by evidence that on some former occasion, he made a statement that was not consistent with his testimony in this case. Evidence of this kind ordinarily may be considered by you only for the limited purpose of deciding the weight to be given the testimony you heard from the witness in this courtroom. However, you may consider a witness's earlier inconsistent statement as evidence without this limitation when the statement was made under oath at a prior hearing or proceeding, or the statement was accurately recorded by a tape recorder, videotape recording, or other similar electronic means of sound recording. So when Dora Fontaine said under oath that she saw McDonald making attacking movements, you, Your Honor, can consider as if she said that in this courtroom today. No matter how far she wants to distance herself from the statement that the offender ignored, raised his right arm as if to attack Van Dyke. She said it under oath a long time before she ever walked into this building that she saw McDonald making attacking movements. You can consider that, Your Honor. In addition to that, when she told the Inspector General under oath with her lawyer sitting right next to her that she doesn't recall telling David March that the offender raised his right arm as if to attack Van Dyke, you can consider that as if she said it today. <coughs> Dora Fontaine lied to you. You know, I can understand. She's in a position where she's a mom, she's got two kids. The job that she has is better than, better than anything she's ever had in her career. She prefers sitting behind the desk right now. She's trying to save herself. And you know, Your Honor, That as a trier fact, you're the sole judge of the believability of the witnesses. You know that when you consider the testimony of any witness, you may take into account his ability and opportunity to observe his age, his memory, his manner while testifying, any interest, bias, or prejudice that he may have, and the reasonableness of his testimony considered in light of all of the evidence in this case. Her interest, her bias, her motive for lying is crystal clear. But let's think about what she said. She admitted to this court that David March at the area did not tell her what to say, did not suggest that her answers could give, did not pressure her in any way, did not direct her what to say, what to look at, did none of those things. And she admitted that when they went over the video, she agreed. She agreed with David March that that's where, Van, uh, that's where McDonald was turning. What she wants to, this court to believe is that everything she said to David March on the street, she said, but for one line. And that line reads, the offender ignored, raised his right arm, and zipped through that Van Dyke. Let's talk about that. The evidence in this case that you have before you is David March wrote, I don't know, 50, 80 pages of reports, single space. And if you believe Fontaine, one line isn't true. Is that proof beyond a reasonable doubt? That's ridiculous. The state wants you to criminalize police reports, which, as you know, Judge, are never given to juries. They're not evidence in most cases. They are summaries. Jurors ask for police reports all the time. Judges say no. There's a reason. Yet the state wants you to believe that one line out of all of those pages, in this case, written by this man who wasn't there, amounts to obstruction of justice, official misconduct, and conspiracy. But let's talk about this then. She admitted to this court 
that she heard several times police saying, drop the knife, drop the knife, drop the knife. Well, you know from the video that Dave Mark preserved for you to see, McDonald doesn't drop the knife. What does that mean? He ignored police commands. So what is she saying? I didn't say that, set, that part of the sentence, even though it's true. Well, if that's the case, Dave March wins. And then further, the offender raised his right arm. I showed in this courtroom that this is raising your right arm. She agreed with that. But what happened, Your Honor, is when the prosecution wants to ask Fontaine questions, how do they pose their question? Did McDonald raise his arm over his shoulder, over his head? No. They want to give you inference that raising right arm means those other things. Well, here's the problem with that prosecution theory. Dave didn't write it. He didn't write he raised right arm over shoulder, raised right arm over head. Dave never wrote those things. They want to show you by body movements. They want you to hear it through their questions. But that's not what Dave wrote. They're stretching it more than could be. You know, in, in, uh, in gang cases, as a prosecutor, we used to call a, a, a person who kind of rolled over and everybody else a flipper. Dora Fontaine is not a flipper. She's a flip flopper. She keeps going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Every time she changes her story, Your Honor, that's reasonable doubt. You cannot find her credible. There was substantial impeachment of Dora Fontaine that you should, I submit, reject her testimony. This is a criminal courtroom. This is not a civil courtroom where the burden of proof is beyond, uh, by a preponderance. 51% doesn't cut it in here. It's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And every time Dora Fontaine flip-flop, she's telling you, I can't be believed. And what kind of a person is she like that? What kind of a police officer is she? Well, she's the kind of police officer who, as soon as her tour of duty begins, she turns the radio down and makes a personal call. That's, that's the kind of police officer this city wants and not a professional, an honest decent man like David March. If that's the case, every citizen of this city is in trouble. In fact, we know from the evidence, even from her own mouth, her partner, Vera Montes, comes out of the Dunkin' Donuts and is telling her, hey, we got to go. There's a call for assistance. It, she didn't know this because her radio's off. That's how she serves and protects the citizens of Chicago. But Vera Montes had to run out and tell her they've got to be the police that night. Vera Montes did not come in this courtroom and said David Marks is lying about his interview. You saw the testimony of, of Dora Fontaine. You are the judge of the believability of her testimony. You know she was impeached. You know she cannot be believed, not in a criminal courtroom with this burden of proof. And then we have Earl Briggs. I, again, over our objection, respectfully, Earl Briggs is allowed to testify. Why? Why? If Dora Fontaine and the evidence in this case was so great, the state wouldn't need to put on Earl Briggs. That is a red flag to you, Judge. Hey, Judge, our case states we're going to put on this medical examiner, quote unquote, investigator. And, 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 and what does he say? He says he's taking a phone call from somebody who claims to be David March. All right. And this person, David March, tells him, among other things, that McDonald lunged at the officer. Really? Okay. Well, how about Mr. Briggs taking a note? Are we asking that? Are we asking too much for this guy who's sitting behind a desk in his midnight chair who won't go out to the crime scene? Is it too much to ask Mr. Briggs to write down a note? Because he did it. Yet the state wants to use Dave March's notes against Dave March. Not fair. 
But again, let's talk about Earl Briggs. He wants this world to believe that that report that he stands by, all of it came from Dave March. That's a crock. Why? Well, there's another report that he doesn't, doesn't want to acknowledge, which shows that that report was changed. There's something funny going on at the medical examiner's office with Earl Briggs' name all over it. That report was changed. And Briggs wants to tell this court that from, from his desk on the phone with David March, he's rereading, he's reading over Dave March what March just told him. And that would include words like on or about October 19th. First of all, it's the wrong day, but be this it may, on or about, those are words lawyers use. All right? And for Briggs to say that's exactly what Dave Marks told is a crack. Briggs got the wrong beat number. Uh, he, he got information that Dave Marks could not possibly have while Dave Marks is at the scene. Dave Marks doesn't know where all the bullet wounds are. Maybe that's from a hospital where McDonald's at, but not from David March. It's impossible for David March to have that information and relate it to Briggs. Impossible. But here's the test. Here's the test, Judge. The police reports submitted by the state with David March's name as the author belie the allegation by Briggs that the word lunged was used. Nowhere in David March's reports does he use the word lunge. No witness who David March interviewed and documented on a general progress report said the word lunge. Lunge didn't come from David March, nor anybody he talked to. You know who it came from? A media person named Pat Camden who worked for Chicago FOP, not the Chicago Police Department. There's no checks and balances for the media. David March didn't say lunge, never wrote it. Why does Earl Briggs testify? Because their case stinks. And then, and then they call Jose Torres. Well, um, Jose Torres is riding in a car with his son on the way to the hospital. His son wanted dad to take off. No police officer told Jose Torres, leave the scene. There's no word spoken by any police officer who, by the way, is in uniform, not plain clothes with a suit and tie on like David Mark would be that night. No police officer told him, leave the scene. Don't leave any contact information. That was never said. But Jose Torres wants you to believe that somehow that unknown police officer, who he can't describe, is shooing him away from the scene. Could we please uh, see Dr. Donut's video number one? Your Honor, this is Dunkin' Donuts video one. It is looking westbound. That is Pulaski Avenue in front. Can you fast forward to where the police car shows? Stop, stop, no, keep going, keep going. Stop right there. Now look, as you know from the evidence, this is Joe Walsh and, and Van Dyke's police cruiser. As you can see, there's another police car coming. Take a look at the east curb, the curb closest to the Dunkin' Donuts parking lot. Do you see any car, any civilian car there that is within two car lengths of the shooting? No. Torres was adamant, I'm only two car lengths away from the shooting. The Dunkin' video, Dunkin' Donuts video contradicts Jose Torres. How ironic, how ironic that the special prosecutors allege that police reporters in this case are lying because the video contradicts the reports, yet we're supposed to believe Jose Torres? 
There is no civilian car on the East curb. He's not two car lengths away. I submit he's so further south by focal point, it's a football field away. And by the way, let's talk about this unknown police officer that Torres can't describe. Do you know why police officers with flashlights are directing traffic? Not to shoo away witnesses, to allow an answer.